Okay, so Janir, do you want me to go ahead and you want me to go ahead and start? Should we introduce ourselves first, or how do you? Sure. you uh, go my name is Janir. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a faculty member at the University of Georgia in mathematics and engineering, and I've authored Econet, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And Stuart is going to start. Okay. And uh, I'm Stuart Whipple, and I'm an, an adjunct uh, professor in ecology, and I've worked a lot with Janir on, on developing the ecology side of this. Uh, and we're kind of a, kind of going to try to tag team this because his, Janir has developed Econet, and uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, he's very good at that. And I'm going to sort of try to give you the background of what, where the, the theory and the background of where the analysis has come from. So I'm going to give you a PowerPoint uh, and hopefully it's going to last, I'm going to try to keep it to half an hour, hopefully less, and then we're going to jump into Econet and start doing some actual analysis and, and get more interactive with, with you guys. So if you could leave yourselves muted for right now, unless you have a really pressing question, and if you do, just say something, like if you're not, if something's not working, you know, or, or something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and, and, and start the presentation. And then once I finish that, I'll hand it off to, to Janir and he'll share his. And then, um, and then we can proceed from there, I think in a, in a slightly more interactive route, okay? All right, so here we go. All right, Janir, do you see that on the screen now? The presentation, okay, I'm gonna move move some of this stuff around over here and make it smaller uh, so I can see better uh, what's going on. Oops. And I will go ahead and start the presentation. Okay. So what we're going to be doing here, uh, really through Econet eventually, is, is we're going to be talking about network environment analysis. And I'm going to give you some of the history and background, and I'm going to do a few examples of some research questions and things and analyses that you can look at. And I'll talk about the way that that links into Econet and another package, which we won't specifically talk about a lot, although we can answer some questions about it. I've used it uh, for, for one project is ENAR, which is an R package that was not developed by engineers, it was developed by Stuart Bort, Matt Lau, and colleagues. So network environment analysis, what is it? Well, it's, it's basically an environmental systems theory. It was developed by Bernard Patton and colleagues largely at University of Georgia that seeks to answer the question, what is the essential nature of the organism environment relationship, i.e. what is environment? And the methodology that it uses of NEA is a set of numerical analyses that are based originally on input-output analysis, which is a matrix-based technique that was developed uh, for economics uh, by Leontiev back in the 60s. And it's used to gain insight into the structure and function of weighted steady state networks, network models. And its NEA is grounded in state space system theory and a differential equation representation. And you use open steady state networks, as you'll see, with a conservative currency of matter or energy. So what are environments? Well, the basic idea as it was developed is, is it's the measurable intrasystem that is within the system boundary environment of all the system components. So if we have a component here, any kind of a component, in our case, my case, it would be some kind of component of the ecosystem, but it could be anything in a model. And it has an input from outside the system and that generates what we call an output environment for that particular uh, compartment. And then if you look if you take something out, look at coming out of the out of the system with Y labeled here, there's an input environment that is created that includes the intrasystem inputs as well as the inputs from outside the system. So we need to have some terminology, and then I'm going to give you an exam an overview of how the how the how the method works, and then uh, a couple of examples of how it how, of how to look at it, so that we can do some interpretation when we get to actually doing some of the analysis in real life <laughs> on, uh, on Econet. So the system boundary is important, as I just mentioned. Everything that we're gonna talk about happens within the boundary. So we have a set of state variables or compartments, as I'll often call them. There are three here, refer to in compartments. We have an input vector, we have an output vector, we have intra 
intercompartmental flows and the matrices, a matrix, an adjacency matrix, which is labeled A here, can tell you where those flows occur in the model, in the model that's shown, which is shown with the digraph arrows. And for example, the, uh, the flow here from, let me get my pointer going, from two to three is represented in the second column and the third row by one. And all the rest of the flows that are there are represented by ones, everything else is zeros. So we, have, we, we can weight those flows, okay, and we'll call those F, and those are, those are in the same place as they were before. And then we can, we can uh, quantify a through flow, which is the total flow at a particular compartment. As an example, we use compartment two here. So if an input from outside the system, we have an inflow from another compartment here representing the, in, the through flow in, then the through flow out, a flow out from two to three, and a flow out of the system. Okay, that's through flow two. So in these models, which I mentioned before, at steady state, that means that dx dt, the change of the compartment, amount in the compartment is zero, we can say that two free flow in equals through flow out. That's an important assumption for the model, for the set of models that we've got here. So then we can have a through flow vector, which is just the total flow at each of the compartments that we have. We can define a total system through, through flow, TST, as the sum of all three of those. It gives you the total activity in that particular model. So here's the setup that's gonna really be the basis for pretty much everything we talk about from now on. I call this the big picture theoretical development. So here's the same model. We're gonna focus on compartment two again. Again, we've got the rest of the compartments there, the X vector, the Z vector, and the Y vector. State variables are compartments, inputs and outputs respectively. Got the flow matrix, and we've got through flow in, through flow out. I'm repeating this again because this is an important concept that we're going to be using here in the analysis. And again, we're at steady state, so dx dt equals zero, through flow in equals through, through flow out. And we're going to look at the what we call the output environment, the forward analysis. Remember in that diagram I just showed you, there's the z coming in produces the output environment. Okay, that's the analysis I'm going to. That, that's the one I'm going to actually show you. The analogous one. I'm not going to actually show the example of, but we're going to, but, but, it, but we can, we can get the analysis for it later. So in this particular case, we're going to be going forward. So we're pushing inputs into the system and looking at how that, what the, what the results are there, in terms of the, in terms of the structure of the model. So to do that, we need a through flow specific coefficient g. Okay, in this case, we're going to, we're going to use the example of g32. Okay and which is over here, which is that F32 divided by the through flow at two, the donating compartment. Okay, we can array those into a matrix G. Okay, and, um, oops, sorry, into a matrix, and then we can use that to map inputs, the Z here, into through flows to do the analysis. And to get that, to get that mapping matrix, we have to take I minus G, that's the identity matrix minus G inverse, and that gives us N, okay, which is, the, which is one of the important matrix, resultant matrices from environment analysis. And that's gonna give us the through flow environment compartment-wise and system-wise measures, okay? And we can also do this, what we call storage, where we take into account not just the flows in the model, but also the storage vector, and we can develop we can do that. Again, we're going forward from inputs into storage. We need stock specific, uh, stock specific coefficients, sorry. And in this case, the example is compartment two. We can get C32, okay, by dividing F32 by the storage. Okay, again, same way, instead of mapping inputs in the through flow, in this case, we're mapping inputs in the storage. We take that C matrix after we do all of the C's and we do minus C inverse to give us a matrix S, which will give us the compartment wide environment measures and the system wide measures for the storage analysis. So there are analogous uh, matrices for the input environment case where you're looking backward against the flow of the, of the, uh, of the arrows. And I'm not gonna show those in the interest of time. But I do want to talk about what something that's important for the interpretation analysis, which is the extended path structure 
that is that is underneath that 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 sort of is part of the theoretical background of this of this um, this analysis. We're going to start out looking at the adjacency matrix. So we're just going to look at the at the flow at the actual digraph and the flows. So again, the adjacency matrix just has zeros and ones, ones where there is a non-zero flow between the compartments and zero otherwise. Given the example of flow three two again, the flow from two to three, which is in column three excuse me, column two, row three here. So we can do a power series of the A matrix, which represents the number of pathways in the, in, from compartment J to I over whatever the, or whatever the power is M. So for example, if we square this adjacency matrix, we get an additional two entries here that I'm gonna show you um, how they get there. For this entry here, we have a path length of one going back to itself, so it's a cycle going from one to three and back to one over a path length of two. In the next one here, the flow from two to one, we can get there over this path of two to three to one. That's why that entry's there. Again, you see as we go up in the number, in the path length, all of the compartments are reachable once you get to higher path lengths, and you see those go up quickly. Now the important idea here is that these direct paths and then the system are represented by adjacency matrix, but the indirect paths are represented by the higher powers, okay? And I referred to that the extended path structure. You hear me mention that again. Now, when we go to weighted paths, that's where the actual environment analysis part comes in. So again, reminding us we've got the through flow normalized flow intensities, the Gs, and we can get that mapping matrix again, the N, so through flow equals N times Z, when we do I minus G inverse. And then another, another interpretation of this is that we can take the same idea of the extended path structure and do a power series of the G matrix, okay? Which actually, which actually ends up converging to I minus G if you have an open system, although that's not necessary to really get into now. However, what's important here is the analogy between the direct and indirect part of the extended path structure. So we can also do this for the storage. I'm not gonna go into it, but the important thing is, is that this is extended path structure is the microscopic interpretation behind the idea that an environment analysis traces the input from the first compartment where, it's, where it comes in from outside the system through this extended path structure, the indirect path structure, until it's exhausted as output. Another piece of this is that the extended path structure is also the mechanism behind the dominance of indirect effects that any NEA results show for most cyclic networks. Okay, and you'll be seeing that in the, in the Econet uh, portion of our, of our bit. Now, the last part we're gonna talk about is utility analysis. Okay, utility analysis is another version of this analysis where you, where you create a D matrix, a difference matrix, which represents the net flow between, between X and, between two different compartments. Okay, and it's computed by the flow forward minus the flow back towards the other compartment, normalized by or divided by the through flow. And in this measure, you can get an ultimate measure, the U matrix, by taking I minus D inverse, and that we call that intensive utility, and it's unitless. And again, the direct and indirect um, uh, extended path structure also applies in this, in this kind of an analysis. So here I'm gonna give you an overview of the kind of analysis, and then I'm gonna give you a couple of examples uh, that I'm gonna go through fairly, fairly quickly. I'm only gonna going sort of highlight, the, the, give you some highlights of the analysis, because this analysis produces a lot of output, and you have to sort of focus on a few things to actually, to actually make sure you get an idea of what's going on. So we already talked about the matrix power series, pathway numbers, flex decomposition is something that, that, that Janir has developed with an Econet that we'll talk about that also uses the unweighted adjacency matrix. Now the weighted flow adjacency matrix, we have the transactions and we have the through flow matrix, the in matrix here we talked about, and I mentioned compartment wise and system wide measures. Well, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna give you a little bit of detail because I'm gonna be giving an example of this. Compartment wise, the in matrix, you can derive the intercompartmental flow partition and boundary flows that go with that particular environment. You can also get the number of compartment visits that correspond for, for that particular environment input. 
And for system-wide measures, you can get a measure of cycling and a measure of indirect effects. For the storage, you need the flow matrix and the, and the X and the, uh, the, uh, the, and the compartment uh, vector as well. And with that, in addition to the environment, environment flows, you can get the storages and you can also get resonance time. And also you can get system-wide measures from that as well. Now with utility analysis, we have the net flow, that's through flow normalized. We get the ultimate utilities with the U matrix. And from that, we can get weighted utility mat values and a qualitative interaction type. And from system-wide, we can get measures that are mutualism and synergism, which are measures, whole system measures of using, using the U matrix um, uh, quantities. So the question is, what kind, of, what kind of things can we actually do with this? And environment analysis. And one that's really, that I'm gonna give you an example of is what I've actually turned here an analytic tracer so that you can input, take an input into the system or an output and see what, what, that, what, that, what that actually does, actually probe the system to see what the, what, how that works. You can also get storage or residence times. You can do cycle analysis. And you can get a measure of the actual activity generated for that particular environment using the total environment through flow that's analogous to the total system through flow that I talked about before. So here's three examples, then I'm gonna give you actually a, a numerical example, but here's, a, here's the general concept of what I'm gonna be talking about in, that, in, that, in those, two, on those two, two examples. So we've got three models down there, and we've got three different, three different inputs or outputs, and each one generates a unique set of flows, intercompartmental flows, boundary flows, and storages. In this way, we're able to evaluate the system-wide consequences of that input or output. So for example, we can say, well, what is the environment flow between compartment two or three if we have an input to compartment one? That would be the through flow environment one in the in, out of the in matrix. Now, if we take an output from compartment two, we can say, what would the input have to be to compartment one to generate that output? Now, if we're doing storage analysis, we can say if we have an input to compartment two, uh, excuse me, to compartment three, what is the storage that's generated in compartment one? And that would be in the S matrix and would be the storage env env output environment for number three. And also the residence time can also be derived from that because storage and residence time are related. So here's an example of a system. We're gonna be doing a water budget model of the Okefenokee watershed that was developed by Ed Reichel for his dissertation, working with Bernie Patton. And I'm gonna show you the initial conceptual model very briefly. So we've got upland storage in the Okefenokee watershed, which is highlighted on the right here, and swamp storage, which is on the right. The reason I'm showing you that is the model that we're gonna show you is a four compartment version of this conceptual model. So here's that model, okay? We got four, 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 four compartments to make it simple. The upland surface is compartment one, upland groundwater is compartment two, swamp surface is compartment three, swamp, swamp subsurface is compartment one. We're gonna have precipitation on the uplands, precipitation on the swamp, and we have outputs. Briefly, they can include evap evapotranspiration, stream flow, and groundwater. Not gonna do anything much with the transfers, and of course, their units here, it's volume of water and it's volume of water per year. And the watershed is the area. So here's an actual environment output, environment, what you can get from environment analysis. So what we want to know is what is the fate of the water that's input to the system? We've got two possibilities. Okay. The first one is, oops, sorry, I lost my cursor. The first one is, is that if we input to compartment three on the surface of the swamp, if it rains there, what, where, how does that, where is that, where can that water go? What can environment analysis tell us about that? Well, immediately you see that water can't go uphill to the uplands, so that entire sector of the model doesn't have anything on it. It's all zeros. So with it, if, you, if you look at the consequences of this from the in matrix, you know, derived from the in matrix, you'll see that most of the output is going to evapotranspiration and stream flow directly from that swamp surface compartment. A tiny bit goes into the subsurface, but very, very little. And the total amount of activity generated is just a tiny bit more than what was originally input. So if we look at, at if something, if we have precipitation on the, 
on the upland surface, okay, what are the consequences of that? So that's input into compartment one. So we see that the whole model is activated because all, you see that all of the, all of the, all of the arrows there in the whole model have some, have non-zero inputs. So a tiny bit of that goes out from that compartment. Most of it moves down to the upland groundwater and leaves from there as output. A small amount of it actually moves over to the swamp surface and leaves as two outputs from that compartment, evapotranspiration and sleep stream flow. And a tiny bit ends up moving in to the swamp subsurface. So if we compare this overall picture, we can see that what environment analysis has been able to tell us is, is that there are big consequences depending on where this input comes into the system in terms of how this, how this, how this, how this, uh, this unit of input moves around the extended path structure. Of this of this system until it's dissipated. Okay, you notice that when it comes in to the swamp to the uh, swamp surface, okay, as opposed to the uplands, much less activity is generated. A third of the uh, less than a third of the activity is generated, and you see that the whole model is actually activated here. Okay, whoops, sorry, I got I lost my pointer again. Sorry. So. Here's a system level measure. It's really the only, the only one I'm gonna show you. The total environment through flow is technically one that was basically a, a, for the other model, but I'm gonna show you another model here very briefly. And this is a, a nitrogen model of Lake Okeechobee that was developed at the Southwater Water Management District by Tom James and his colleagues. And there's six compartments here, and it's not important, They're, it's basically different forms of nitrogen and phytoplankton in the water column versus the sediment, which is an important thing for this particular system. But what's important to note here is that this is an actual N matrix that we've got here, okay, for this particular model. And you'll note, oops, sorry, I lost my pointer again. You'll notice that these principal diagonal elements, which quantify that number of compartment visits that I mentioned before is one of the things comes out of the N matrix. You see a lot of variation here when you look through the different compartments, anywhere from 11 visits down to a little over one. Okay, and what you can do with that, with those diagonal entries is that with using the fin cycling index that was developed, and if you weight those uh, diagonal entries by the through flow, you can develop a cycling index for each compartment and for the whole system. So for example, for the two uh, organic nitrogen compartments here that are visited about 11 times, in other words, that means that the that if you input to those compartments, it's the the nitrogen cycles around on average about 11 times through, through that compartment. Again, you get about 91% cycling, very high. If you go to the water column inorganic nitrogen and the phytoplankton, it's about 2.6 times. And using the cycling index, that corresponds to about 61%. The last two, much lower. 37 and 24. The overall cycling index is about 86%. So it's a highly cyclic model, but that's not unusual when you're talking about a biogeochemical system. We found that that's generally true. If you're talking about other kinds of systems, retentiveness or the amount of cycling of a substance, how much it stays in the system and hits the compartments before it leaves, could be a whole lot lower. So the last part I'm gonna talk about is give one very simple example of utility analysis. There's a lot to this, and it, this, it's very hard to kind of come up with a real simple example of what I've tried. So, so far, we've talked about transactions and environments, but can we use these transaction networks to derive relations between compartments? Okay, and we can use utility analysis to do that. And what I mean by relations, one example of that, a simple way of thinking of that, is just the ecosystem interaction types, the plus minus minus plus, minus minus competition and mutualism that we can get. And then there are whole system measures that I mentioned before. I'll give one example of that in the, in our, in the example that I'm gonna give you. So quickly, it's a very simple toy model, but in this particular model, we're gonna start out saying that if we've got two compartments here, in this case, a bear and a wolf feeding on caribou, they're competing to eat the, to eat the caribou. But if we introduce a way where the bear actually eats the wolf, and the caribou and the wolf only eats the caribou, then we've got cross-level or what ecologists often call intragill filled feeding. And then it becomes indeterminate in terms of what the interaction types would be based on that. 
And it turns out that when you do the, if you look at the analysis, that this sort of structure, the flow weights and for that particular model actually determine what that is, what, what, what the interaction types will be. And, the, and one of the first papers that was done on that path, Patton and Whipple said, call this parametric determination. So if we show this as an example, we've got two cases. So here's a, here's a, here's a quantified example of that same exact model. Okay, the question is, is what is the relationship between the bear and the caribou in this case? So if we do the utility analysis and we take the sign of the U matrix, we find that, that actually the relationship is a plus minus, which you might expect because the bear is a predator on the caribou. However, if you change the weightings of the intercompartmental flow slightly and say, well, then what is the relationship here? Is it the same in this particular case, surprisingly enough for a predator, from an ecologist's point of view, the relationship actually turns to mutualism, despite the fact that individual caribou obviously are still being consumed. But on a system level, the relationship turns out to be plus plus. That's kind of a really interesting result, I think. So we find that when we change the weights of the intercompartmental flows by a certain amount, which basically would mean just changing the amount that the bear chooses to feed on one or the other, it changed the sign of the interaction matrix from predation or nihilism, which is another way to say that, to mutualism. And then for a system-wide measure, if we add up, do a ratio of the number of positive uh, uh, interaction, uh, positive uh, number, uh, positive values in each of these, we see that in the case one, we have six over three, six pluses to three minuses, which gives us a mutualism for the system of two, whereas in case two on the right, there are actually seven. So seven over two gives us a mutualism of 3.5. So it's a pretty big difference for just changing the, the, the actual, the, the, the distribution of flows. Otherwise the model, the models are, 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 are identical. So I'm gonna give a really brief discussion because Janir may mention it because it's output from Econet. It's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit off the track, but it's related in terms of trying to understand the structure of these models. So if we have a model here that's, real, that's talked about as F, the flux decomposition is a way of parsing that into an arbitrary network of two types. The first type is a simple path with one input and one output and no related and no repeated flows. So the first of those comes in at compartment one, goes to two and outputs there. The second, second one of those for this model with input at one, go to two, three, and then output, that's flux number two. The last one is a simple cycle, including all the compartments in this particular case, one, two, and three, and no inputs or outputs. And the decomposition, the actual result of this, is that you can represent it as a linear combination of these fluxes. So in this, for this particular model, you can take 1.3 times this flux, quantitatively two times this flux, and 1.2 times this flux, which is the cycle, and that will actually reconstitute the original flow, the original, the original uh, model. So very, very briefly, because I've already taken up pretty close to my allotted time and we have, we have limited time here today. Equinet basically will allow us to do the analyses and more that I, that I showed here. And ENAR that was developed by Stuart Boren and Matt Lau, and that's the reference for it. You've already got that in the PDF that I emailed you guys. One of those emails bounced, by the way. We'll have to handle that at the end uh, or at some point to get, to, get if, to get that person's correct ear. Anyway, this is an R package that does a lot of the same kinds of things and more, actually, than what you'll see that Janir is going to demonstrate with Econet. But for the purposes of time, and because Janir is so familiar with Econet since he developed it and he knows everything and the ins and outs of how it works, we're going to stick with that. But all of these kinds of analysis I was just talking about, the structural analysis, the through flow and storage analysis of the environs utility and the environs themselves can be gotten from ENAR. So if we have some folks that are familiar with R, this is a really powerful package. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. And I actually have a, a website that I, can, that I can point you to that actually will step you through an analysis that Stuart Borat has shown. It's basically a sort of a online workshop, I would say. So now, now that I've finished giving you this very quick introduction, there, I know there may be some questions later on when we talk about internet, econet, but I think in the context of the analysis with Janir that 
it will things things that I talked about from a more of a theoretical point of view and just an example when you're able to see how this works and actually see the and see him change the models and things it will become a lot clearer so here's Janir <laughs> Oops. Oh, I've unmuted Janir. Okay, hang on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't know I had done that. I, I think I did that, but that's okay. Okay, okay. Uh, so, okay go ahead. So, let, let me repeat myself. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about Econet with a presentation right now and then we'll go ahead and demonstrate it and at which point you can also run your own little simulations and ask any questions that you have and i think we agreed that people would raise hands and we would basically answer questions based on that and um so this is the presentation so what is equine it's basically a web-based simulation software and uh, what it does is basically it takes the model that you put in and it creates a network diagram of it. And it will take the uh, input and will turn it into uh, mathematical equations. This would be a differential equation, a stochastic process, depending on the options chosen. And then it will numerically solve them. And then it would basically give you a plot, the time course. And based on the last, uh, state of the system, it will do network analysis and also include that results. And throughout the presentation, some of the uh, items will be in this color. Those are the features that are not present in the current version of the Econet, but the test version, which I'm also going to show you towards the end. So if something is in this color, it means that it's, it's a feature being implemented. So this is basically what it looks like. Uh, it's quite simple. It has three parts. The first part is a big text box where you enter your model using the keyboard. And the second part is a numerical method chosen for simulation. And the third part are parameters uh, depending on the uh, simulation method chosen. So, for example, if you were to choose, let's say, a Gillespie stochastic algorithm, well, that does not have a step size in, so this would disappear and only a time would appear. So these options are depending on the method chosen here. And then you hit run model and wait. So uh, the regular version of the Econet is limited to two minute runs. So if your simulation takes more than two minutes, it will stop and show the current state. Uh, it rarely happens because it's really fast, but if you have something really big, uh, it might take a long time, but often you can choose these options to make it run uh, faster. And the default method chosen is pretty fast as is. Um, and the test version that we have is uh, unlimited right now. So, uh, and then that, that's, that, that's why it's the test version, but we'll see. Uh, so how does the model structure look like? So how, how would one describe its model into Econet? So it basically is again formed of four parts. The first is the relations, the interactions between those compartments. And there you, you put a dash and a lar larger than sign that would constitute the flows. And the names of the compartments, you just write them as they are. And you represent the environment using a star. So this would mean that the detritus compartment an environmental input. And then these are the flows between compartments. And this would basically, these two compartments would have an output to the environment. And then of course, how fast do these occur? Right? And, and that speed is probably going to change over time. So both of those are represented using this uh, single uh, term. So C is actually is related to not just the speed, but also the type of flow that I'm going to go over uh, momentarily. 
Uh, this is the speed. So how fast is likely this to happen? But then again, so here there's a flow from detritus to microbiota. This flow can depend on the, the amount of detritus or can depend on the amount of microbiota or both. So uh, this choice is, is governed by this letter C here. And of course, uh, not just the type, but also there is a rate, right? All of them might be of the same type, but might just have the tendency to occur faster than the others. So uh, the, the rate at which uh, the plants consume, uh, or, or let's say the rates at which the insects consume biomass is going to be different than the rate at which a large cat is going to consume biomass. So that speed difference would be re uh, represented by the constant. And then, well, you have to have an initial condition to start where things are going to evolve from there. And those are represented by the name of the compartment and equal to sign and then uh, some value. Now, it's important that you have a space around the equal to sign here, but no space is needed. Uh, actually, no space should be around the flow type. That's how Econet distinguishes flow types from initial conditions. And the rest is uh, just comments. You can put comments around it using uh, starting with this uh, square sign. And that's it. So these are the four, four parts that would constitute an Econet model. Uh, comments, flow types and coefficients, flows and initial conditions. Now, it has a really flexible structure, so it need not be exactly in this uh, configuration. This is the exact same model as you've seen before. And what we see here is there's a flow, there's a type, and then the initial condition, another flow, another rate. And here we have some initial conditions and some other flows, and you can see some other rates. So this model is going to be interpreted correctly and run exactly as the same as this previous one. So this uh, flexibility is what's going to make it really easy to make changes and uh, run it as we'll see when we start working on it. So what are the properties of this network diagram that it draws? So it's hierarchical, so it's based on trophic levels pretty much, uh, but not exactly. So if you have something, if, if here, this is the oyster reef ecosystem model, not that pretty much every other compartment is basically uh, getting its energy from the filter feeders, the oysters. That's why it's at the top. And the top predator would be uh, at the bottom. So this is the predator that's basically feeding on everything else, so it's at the bottom. And everything else is going to be laid out uh, in between. Again, according, according to its hierarchical level. And it's optimized for visual information. Uh, what that means is that uh, the compartments that are well connected are going to be centralized. And there will be very few flow of intersections and you can see that there are none here because it was possible, but if you have a really large model that has this really complex, then it's impossible to avoid, but it will try to minimize those. And another one is short low curvature flows, so there are no sharp intersections and it's going to be smooth. And again, those are going to be as low curvature as possible, so you won't have a flow that just circles around to avoid an intersection. So it's very well optimized. Uh, and also its publication quality. So the pictures that you see on Econet website are going to be uh, uh, GIFs for PNG files. Uh, but once you click on the figure, it'll ask you to save it in EPS format, which is vector-based. So a, a figure in EPS format can be converted to a, a GIF, a PNG, or a G, JPEG of any size. So you can include it in a paper, a poster, you can magnify it and it will always look uh, smooth. And indicates flow values visual and numerically. So this is again uh, a feature that will be implemented in the new version. It's, it's ready, but it's not up uh, in the website yet. So this is what that looks like. And uh, we're still you know, working out some of the details like this a large arrow is a little bit protruding here. But what this does is the previous version, it just shows you the flows, the existence, the interactions. But this will actually show you, it will quantify the interactions. So at steady state, when everything is finished, when the simulation is done, these are the flow rates between the compartments. So here we see a numerical uh, flow rate. So you can see that this is really large. This is the next large, right? And this is 
the third largest. And uh, so here, this one is really slow, for example, this is the feeding of the predators. And you can see that reflected by the thickness of the arrows here. So the thicker the arrow, the, the higher the flow rate. So this contains more information uh, than the previous one. And we will, we're trying to find a way to do this, especially this one, you can see that, uh, you know, th this is nice, it gives you more information, but not numerical information. This does, but at the cost of having a little bit more convoluted. So as you include more information, it gets more difficult to uh, interpret it. Anyhow, so what I mean, what I meant by the flow types and flow rates is the following. So assume that you have a flow from compartment A to compartment B, and assume this is a downward controlled flow in that if you change the amount of B, the flow rate does not change. So this would be like uh, the, the, the deer uh, giving biomass to the plants. So the, through fecal matter, there will be a transfer of uh, material from the deer compartment to the plants. And, but the plants do not have the capability to demand from the deer. The more the deer you have, the more the fecal matter, the more the input to the, the, to the plants. So that is going to be a donor control flow, then it's just going to be depending on the amount of A. So for that type of flow, you would say C equals, the C is the letter used. And then the differential equation or the stochastic process used to implement this flow is going to be computed as three times the storage amount of A. Now, but if you have a, a feeding relationship, let's say between uh, a predator of deer, like a wolf pack and, and deer, then while that speed of flow is going to be dependent on both the amount of the deer we have and the amount of wolf we have. So, and for that type of flow, the donor recipient control flow, you would use R. And that would mean that, so the interpreter would compute the flow rate as three times the amount of A times the amount of B. And uh, so this is, again, a feature that is not yet up on the regular version of Econet. So this is Michaelis Menten. And this, this has two coefficients in it. And this is how the equation is computed. Uh, it's also called monode uh, type of flow interaction or hill type flow interaction, hill type one. So what this means is that uh, often Note that there is no recipient controlled flow. So we do not have an option where it's only equal to a constant times the amount of E. And that's intentional because if you do that, then the equations are going to demand what they may not exist. And that is going to give you negative storage values uh, in certain cases. So to avoid that, but to have the capability of recipient flow, uh, this is invented. So what, uh, this is not Econet, so of course this is well documented. Uh, so what this does is, uh, if you have an abundance of the source material, A, uh, at the limit, if you take the limit of this expression as the storage amount of A goes to infinity, these two are going to be canceled because this five is going to be negligible compared to the storage amount of A, so we can ignore five. And then the storage of A will be canceled with this one. It will be like three times storage of B. So it will be almost like a recipient control. Uh, so think about uh, fishing when the fishing season just started everywhere is full of fish. So you're basically limited by the amount of fish you can catch. Uh, but but uh, this requires two uh, components. So that's in the, so we're, we're trying to make it work at the moment. So how does a model get turns into an ODE? So this is just an example. So you have an environmental input into plants. So that would, now, since this is an environmental input, the environment does not have a storage value. So it's just taken to be unity. So it's just going to be one. So DP by DT, P represents the plants, D the detritus, uh, I'm sorry, D the deer. So here it's going to be like 25. And then the plants and the deer have this predatory relationship. And it's R is used, so it's going to be 1.1 times P times D. And th this is taken out from the plants and added to the deer, so it's a negative here and a positive here. And the deer is going feeding the plants with some right, and now this is donor control, so I use the C. And here it's going to be, again, added to the plant but subtracted from the deer. And then deer uh, do migrate or uh, die, so it's a death rate. And it, again, only depends on the deer, so it's just that. 
And if you change this to an R, it would not matter because again, the storage amount of the environment is taken to be one. And then these are taken as to be the initial conditions. So this is what the, if your chosen method was the adaptive Rangakata or regular Rangakata, those are the ordinary differential equation solution methods. The equinet would basically simulate this equation and plot the solution. And uh, so those are the two uh, methods. So the adaptive one, so normally differential equation solutions contain something called a step size and this it often has to be small to be accurate. Accuracy increases with it being small, but when you make it small, it takes longer. So a method was developed that is adaptive, meaning that it would change its steps to uh, the differential equation. That's the default method in Econet. Now, if it's running too long, or if there is some issue as, as a debugging method, uh, this regular step uh, fourth order fixed step size method can be chosen. But this works almost great in any chance. This is also the recommended one uh, to be used in MATLAB and Octave. It also contains two stochastic methods. Uh, one is based on uh, Gillespie's algorithm. The other one is continuous. So this is discrete. Uh, this is a continuous method. These are a little bit more complicated, but, but, but they're accurate and they work well. Uh, but you'd have to read about them to be able to use. Well, you can just use them uh, without doing anything in Econet, but uh, it's, it's difficult to explain what these are. Uh, but, but basically here, each time you run them, they would look different. But if you take an average of, say, a thousand runs, uh, these would match the order and differential equations. So they are, they are well designed uh, according to, uh, so there's a paper on this from 1977, and this was published, I believe, in 2006 or something. Uh, the, the, but on Econet, if you click on the link, you'll see these explained in detail. So there are to the papers. So network, network particle tracking, uh, not, not up yet, but this is going to be a feature of the new one. What this does is, uh, instead of looking, instead of tracking the total, total storage amount, it would actually track the individual's particles. So uh, if it's a flow of nitrogen, it would basically track little packets of nitrogen, which would represent a fixed amount of nitrogen. Uh, it's like nitrogen atoms, but of course, uh, a, a simulation in the atomic uh, resolution will not be possible, but think about small amounts of nitrogen packets that flow through the network. And it will basically track each and every one of them and give you an output of those paths. So this is what that basically looks like for the Econet model. So uh, what we see here is, uh, the oyster reef ecosystem model, and it has six compartments, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the, the numbers here correspond to those compartments. So, and this is a path. So one, two, four, two is a path, and that corresponds to the, again, uh, here, a path is a particle coming into this network, spending some time on it, and then exiting the system. So this one would represent a particle came into compartment one and then left. So it would basically correspond to this path. Now, this one, one, two, three, means that a particle came into compartment one, passed to two, passed to three, and then exited the system. And one, six would be a particle came in here, ran to compartment six, and exited the system. This is basically a frequency of those paths. So among all the material that entered into the system, over 60% of them, this. Uh, about slightly higher than 10% of them done, does this. And about, again, about slightly, about the same percentage does this and etc. So this would basically give you a picture of this. It can also give you when each of those happen, because uh, each of these are a lot of little events. Uh, but that's what, what we're trying, what, what it does. So it's, it's a little bit more uh, computationally heavy. Uh, so I think it will have not a two minute limit, but say a little bit more. Uh, but we're trying to make sure that it will work for everybody uh, simultaneously. So this Econet has been up since 2007. Uh, its numerical component is fast, uh, but it's limited with your internet connection also, like things might be downloading slower, but often the numerical portion is done at an instant. Uh, the remaining stuff is other components. 
So it's critical components is written in C++, that's why it's fast. Uh, and it's a server-side application, meaning that it, it does not run on your computer. You can run it from your cell phone, it will run at almost at the same speed because it does not use your cell phone's uh, computational resources. And its results are available also, you can export the results to MATLAB in a spreadsheet format, and also ENAR, again, this is in the works. And that's an R package that the Stuart mentioned earlier. And it's, it's flexible to work with. You can modify your models easily. And also you can email a model. Everything is in text format, so it's uh, extremely portable. Uh, Privacy, I'd like to mention this. So, uh, you know, you enter a model, what happens to it? So to be able to work with it, Econet is going to have to store it in a text file. And that's in a directory in the server. And on Monday, every week at about like 5 a.m., all of them get deleted. So that, that's what happens to our model. And who has access to the server? I, it is just me and the IT, uh, IT people at the engineering at the University of Georgia. And this is the, there is no direct link to the beta version that has some of these new, uh, new uh, features that is implemented in this, is, uh, this one. So you have to type this literally in. There is no link pointing towards it. And that's because it does not have any safeguards in it. So again, the regular Econet, it'll, do, it'll run for two minutes and it's going to self-terminate. There's something wrong. This does not. And when, you act, when anybody runs this one, I get an email, not to my regular account, but an email to a separate inbox saying that it's been used from this IP address and et cetera. So just so you know, you can certainly use this one, but um, uh, the, the same privacy uh, is not, and I'm doing this just because to see what issues there are. So, so if something does not work, I'd like to know what in the model causes that, and I'll try to fix things as we observe. Okay, um, so this is a, a Turkish small bus driver. I'm originally from Turkey, and there has been a study about seven, eight years ago about how the structure of the brain of London taxi drivers are different from almost everybody else. Uh, they have a larger hippocampi, a part of the brain that manages uh, spatial uh, navigation. So, so this fancy creature is a Turkish bus driver. They probably do not have that fancy a brain as a London taxi driver, but these have amazing um, capabilities for multitasking. So you see this person is driving the bus, smoking, drinking tea, uh, giving money back to a customer and driving at the same time and probably hunting for new passengers because you hold up your hand and it will stop. Like they don't have regular bus stops at all. So, so it's is the basic new model of the person. So uh, what, what, when you hit run model in Econet, what it will do is it will spawn these numerical simulations. And while it's doing that, it will use graphics to put the network diagram. The placement of the nodes and the arrows is a difficult optimization problem and I did not write that an open source uh, software called Graphis handles that. And it will use GNU plot to do the time course plot, time course figure, which is like MATLAB's graphing libraries, but uh, open source. Uh, and the Python will do the network flux decomposition uh, on the beta version. And everything is uh, tied together using Linux shell scripts. And the CGI is uh, handling the web interface. And okay, so this is it. We're going to demonstrate it. This is a, a, a nice quote, uh, not the actor Tim Allen, but the uh, complexity uh, scientist. Uh, so science is not about the truth. It's about which lies we can afford to tell. I guess this is uh, what pretty much every model contains. It has to represent what happens in real life as best as possible, but of course, contain enough simplifications to be able to do so. So what I'm going to do right now is going to, I'm going to stop the presentation and uh, spawn a web browser and I'm going to Econet. And at this point, I'm going to ask Stuart to join me as well. Okay. Okay. So I'll share the web browser. Okay. So 
here is uh, the web browser that we make it a tap smaller, perhaps. <clears throat> so you can adjust the size of this window. And when, so I just, I did not enter anything into Econet. Uh, by the way, so this is the uh, address. And I think if you just search for Econet um, software, that's what you'll, you'll, you'll see. Right. So. That's uh, the address that I sent in the, uh, in the PDF that I emailed folks before the. Uh, Right. So if you search for Econet software, that is what should come up on Google. So, uh, and this is the model that you already have uh, in it as, as a test version. And if you just hit run model, it should run. So not much a learning curve at the beginning. So here is the, uh, and, and again, this is a PNG figure. And if you click on it, It'll, it'll spawn a new window, which you would probably you might not be seeing at this point. It basically tells me. Uh, uh, we don't see that, Janir, but that's right. okay. So it basically asks me if you networkgraph.eps. So that EPS is, stands for encapsulated postscript. So that's vector based. And it can be converted into SVG. And again, uh, the regular bitmap versions of any resolution you wish so. And that also holds for this figure. And See, the, if you'd like to create another figure, you can just click on this. It will give you the data. Again, it asks me what to do with this text file. So just the text file of, that contains all of this data that you can use any other software to form that graph. So these are the initial storage values of each compartment. So, right, so how is this organized? There are compartmental properties, system-wide properties, and matrix properties. So it's dependent on the size of the output. Engineer, hang on just a sec. I was going to make a comment. Are you going to comment on what, what, why you chose this particular model? Because it looks familiar. Should it, it should look familiar to folks that are watching. Does anybody recognize, you guys recognize why, why this model's familiar based on my previous presentation? Anyway, I, I know we can't all respond, but, but anyway, so you, give, you can give them the answer, Jimmy. I'll, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Go ahead. Um, uh, did you ask me, Stuart? Well, I just wanted you to, to, to say that this, this, I wanted to say that this model, I was asking to see if anybody could, if you wanted to comment, it's basically the, the, uh, the integral predation model. It's just a different set of, it's just a set, different set of, just the compartments are just labeled differently. So we can, we can court, you can make that correspondence back to the previous, you know, back to the presentation. That's all I was trying to do. Right, so, so it's basically the fish is feeding directly on the phytoplankton or through an intermediary compartment called zooplankton, right? And so a couple of people on chat figured it out before, before, before we figured out our little, our little setup here. Good job. Right. Um, I'll ask you to like actually build the link as we modify it. Um, and so the compartmental properties are the initial storage, the final storage, and then the environmental inputs and outputs from each compartment. And again, the names of the compartments are on the left. So the true flow is the amount of uh, total flow passing through a compartment. And you know, amount of total input, amount of total output. Comparing these two, you can see if the system is at steady state or not. And also, if you take a look at this figure, everything is a straight line, meaning that there are no changes anymore. So the input into any compartment should be equal to the output rate from any compartment. And that, and how, so this is a straight line, but how straight it is, well, this difference will tell you. And the residence time is, again, how much the material uh, spent at each compartment on average. And the trophic level is, is the trophic level. Um, and you have some uh, system-wide properties here. Uh, of note are, I guess, the cycling. And again, there is no cycling here. If you take a look at the network diagram. Uh, nothing cycles, and hence that's equal to zero, but you know, we can add some cycling to see what percentage of cycling there is in the system. Uh, and again, here at this point, you have a lot of indices here, like synergism, indirect effects. If you'd like to learn about any of these, you can hit learn more. And here, all of them are explained. Uh, if it's simple, we will directly give you an, a definition of it. But if it's more complicated, we'll give you links to papers. So if you'd like to learn about the thin cycling index, you would click on here 
basically give you the link of the paper that you could learn about that at a separate window. So you can see that there's a lot more, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more, for example, system wide properties represented here than I gave. I just wanted to give some, ex a couple of examples. Right. So, so basically what Janir is telling you is that there's, there's a whole set here and that you can actually see where they come from by clicking on that, on that link. Just wanted to point that out. Right. And this is the adjacency matrix. So is, if there's a link between any compartments, it's a one, otherwise it's equal to zero. Uh, stoichiometric matrix is something similar. Uh, so it basically tells us uh, how the compartmental values change when a flow happens. Uh, and again, at any of these, if you hit learn more, you'll see what that is. You'll see references to it um, and why you should be concerned about that. And flow matrix is pretty much the same as the adjacency matrix, but it's uh, weighted. Uh, and this is the end matrix that uh, Stuart was referring to. And I wanted to point out something. Notice when, we, when, when I showed the example of the nitrogen model, if you guys remember back to that one, you remember that all of those values were greater than one for all of the compartments. That's six compartments, so it's a bigger model, but you notice if you have a model anytime and you notice that those values are all exactly one, you know that you've got, a, you've got a tree model, you have no cycling. Things just come in and flow through and come out and that's it. So you, you see that, the, that when we start changing the model and add cycling, you notice that that changes. And of course, once that changes, you'll see also that the reflected in the fin cycling index being something other than zero. And then this is the utility analysis. These are the how the compartments are affected from each other. So, so this basically tells us that the, the zooplankton is affecting the phytoplankton negatively because it's feeding on it. And likewise, phytoplankton is affecting zooplankton positively uh, because zooplankton is feeding on it. And that relation can be a little bit difficult to decipher in larger networks, but it's computed and uh, printed here. And here you see the analysis data in MATLAB up to format. So if you'd like to export all of this data into uh, MATLAB, you can do so. So again, uh, if you click on this, it will give you a text file again, but in MATLAB format. Uh, and, 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 you, and it also contains the model and all the matrices, the vectors, and the scalar outputs of this system. And also it contains a model, a, 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 a variable called NEA. And if you take that and input it into the NEA.m MATLAB file that was written by Pat and Borek in 2004, I think, right? So you will see uh, the, the email that Stuart Whipple sent you all earlier. It does contain a link to that paper. Uh, so it's a MATLAB file, MATLAB uh, code for doing more than this. It, 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 it also does uh, environments. Uh, but it does everything in here as well, besides the numerical simulation part. It's a static analysis. So this will basically, uh, when the system uh, stopped evolving right at the very end, it will package all the flow rates, inputs and outputs and the storages. And that you can directly feed into MATLAB. Um, and and uh, so actually you can see that if you take a look at the code log, I think here, uh, these are the right. So I apparently I implemented it 2010, and this is basically uh, the name of the file that you'll be downloading is called Econet Results, and then you can directly run this in MATLAB. If you, so, this capital NEA is the uh, name of the code that uh, Barton Boret wrote in 2004, which is available in MATLAB file exchange, and this is the variable that is included in Econet Results, and you can directly get the output, you know, without adding anything, modifying anything just immediately. And I think there is also uh, a link here, right? So this I think is going to directly point to the paper. Oh, no, the, okay, right. So, so uh, this is where you can download the NEA.m file. Mm -hmm. I, I, included the, I included the web link and the paper in, in, the, in their, uh, they have a reference for it. And this is the common separated uh, <laughs> file. And if you click on it, it will ask you to save it. So it will put everything in a spreadsheet format. And uh, simulation for time course, this is the same as the data that is present right here.
and it also has show extended results. So here it has a little bit more information. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, in the new version, we'll get rid of this because uh, I, I guess it, it, it contains a lot of uh, a lot of output as is. So uh, one one change. So I will uh, ask input from uh, Stuart at this point as well. So I think we decided to do the uh, include cycling first, right? So what if we have a what if we want cycling in the system? And actually, there should be. Fish is going to have some excrements that are going to be a nitrogen for, source for the phytoplankton. So what if we put that back in, and that would constitute a cycle? So you can do that easily by say you have a uh, you, you want a flow from fish back to phytoplankton and it has to occur at some rate right so here is that rate and now hit run model again and now we should have some cycling in the system and right there it is and that changed the values a little bit but if you take a look at the cycling index we should have a positive cycling index right now and if you go to the N matrix, and now we have some values that are larger than one on the main diagonal. Again, referring to what Stuart showed you earlier about cycling. So you can see that 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 that, that what it, what what this what this analysis is 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 sort of trying to point out to you is is that you immediately are able to understand. The relationship between when you make a change in the model and you say, okay, I get a change in the in the output in terms of the, the state variables, but then what does that actually mean for the for the extended path structure, the internal structure of what's actually going on inside the model? And so that that this this as you can see from the perspective of environment analysis, a big step has been taken here in terms of the fact that that it, this has changed a lot. Uh, quite a few of the of the of the uh, of the properties of the model. If Janir, if you could go back up to the top, where you have the system wide measures for a second, I wanted to show another one. Okay, look, whoops. So if you look at the uh, the indirect effects, okay, you'll see that it's actually if we compare it. I don't know if we can compare it to the previous run, but it's it's going to. I'm sure, almost positive, it's probably going to be a lot going to be higher. Okay, and that's generally what you find in most of the models is that when you include cycling, indirect effects are gonna go up, okay, in general. Yeah. Okay. So, so this, is a, this is a really simple model. So some of these things are, the changes may not be, may not be easily, you know, may, may not be easily seen initially, but, 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 it, but the fundamental change in the model is, is nevertheless, you know, reflected in some of them in, 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 in many of the measures. It takes some digging sometimes to actually see this because, of course, you know, intuitively you might think, well, if I make this change, I expect this. Well, we find out that when we, when we start talking about, you know, things like indirect effects and cycling in models, particularly if you've got a model that's more complicated than what we've got here, things can get a little more difficult to sort of intuit your way around, which is the so whole what idea. What I'm going to do is like include, say, a predator fish, make the model larger. So what I'm going to do is add a flow from fish to let's say sharks uh, at some rate, and I'm going to make it on the recipient control uh, with this rate. So now we have a new compartment. And now if I try to run this, it's going to complain. So it, it basically tells me that uh, here, no initial condition exists for sharks. So that, and that's true, right? It has to have an initial amount of sharks in it for it to be able to uh, simulate. So, so you will get often, often uh, meaningful uh, messages from Econet like that. So again, this is the sum population density and I'm not going to make it uh, too much. Right, so let, let, let's see what happens now. Okay, now it did run, right? And I have a sharks compartment right now and uh, and now one thing here, it looks nice, but there's no output from sharks, meaning that things are going to accumulate at sharks and it might just get out of hand over time. And as you see in the time course figure, these two appear to be at steady state, but sharks kind of keep increasing, right? 
And now this sim simulation was run for 100 time units. And again, the units are, can be days, weeks, months. It depends on your model. It's model specific. So let's run this for, let's say, 200 or 300 time units to see what will be different. So I'm going to run it, let's say, for 200 time units. And you'll see that it won't matter much because it's adaptive. And it gets worse, it's exponential. And maybe things are going to go, go really out of hand if I do a 300 here. And sure it does, right? It does just, it, it explodes. And this is no way a model should run. And that's because sharks should either die or migrate. Uh, so they should have some uh, death term in them. Otherwise, the system is never going to stabilize. So I can do that by adding sharks go to the environment with, again, some rate. OK, let's run that now. OK, uh, perhaps I was a tad too aggressive. It's, it's, really <laughs> it's really close to uh, zero. It just died out really fast. Uh, but, but we can balance that. Uh, but now it's, 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 it's a working system. And again, everything is computed at each time you hit this. And uh, I, I do not want to uh, spend too much time on this, but would like to answer more questions. So here are the methods that you choose. And if you choose, let's say, a, a stochastic, so adaptive step size. So if you choose this one, so this is the adaptive one, it's total time, and sensitivity is basically how accurate you want your solutions to be. And it is a proportion of the actual values. So if you run your model, you'll see that your values are in the order of tens. So the values are at most 10. So an accuracy value of 0.001 is pretty good. Uh, but if your values are in the orders of hundreds of thousands, then it might run slow with this sensitivity, and you might choose to increase it. Uh, let me see if we can actually trigger that to happen. So I guess that would happen if we increase the weights I had. And like make the output small, I guess. Sure. And make the initial conditions large too. Okay. Oh, that's going to cause a little paper. But let, let, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to go back to the sensitivity value and let's see if it works or not. Okay. Well, it did not increase much. It's on the, in the order of hundreds right now. Uh, and what happened was things got uh, stabilized. Probably we need to restrict the outputs further so that things can accumulate more. Let's have, well, a lot of sharks is probably not a good, good idea. Um, but are there any other outputs? No. And let's increase the input further. All right, let's see what happens. So I'm just trying to get high values. So now you see that it is running a tad slower than before because this thing probably has a lot of high values and my sensitivity, my accuracy, desired accuracy is really low. So I'm going to, at this point, you can, you can, if you do not want to wait, you can just hit back and you can uh, increase the sensitivity and then run again. And okay, so here it says amount of uh, users currently accessing the internet low. Low means that everybody gets a computing core node. Uh, but if any node is shared, it'll show, uh, it'll show a medium. And if everybody is sharing the node, it'll show high. So you can see how heavy Econet is being utilized. Okay, so uh, that's the reason. Look at the values, right? <laughs> uh, and, and it's still not have stabilized yet. We'll probably need to run it longer. But that's how the sensitivity parameter helps us. Uh, to make this work. Uh, and is, is this the sharks? Yeah, the sharks are not dying fast enough. And uh, I no, want to... Yeah. What's that? 
Yeah, I think I think you I think the I think the sharks sort of sort of sort of like just kept going because they had a very small output. Right, right. So I think I'll just go ahead and do this and maybe run this a tad shorter. Let's see that. I'd like to show the. Okay, so that's that's what that looks like. It's being stabilized right now. But I wanted to show the stochastic one just in case. Uh, so this is a, 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 a tad tricky, honestly, but let's see if it works. It, it, it works, but um, you have to, okay. So you see it's the same as the ODE, but there are these fluctuations. And if you average them, you'll get the ODE. And th this is kind of mathematically and numerically really difficult to, to do right. And, and this works. And if I hit reload, it will run it again. And the results are going to look a little bit different this time. Okay. So uh, believe it or not, both of them are actually correct. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, so the default value was 10. I think it's doing that. Uh, so it's different than what I had earlier because uh, it's a different model. So uh, it, it doesn't match the very first one that I did. Uh, but so this one, and now it seems like intersecting with each other. If I run this again, it will look different. But both of them are OK. And if you average them, it should match the ODE perfectly. But that's what I'm going to say. Say uh, here. Is there anything that you'd like to add, Stuart? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> we're doing a lot of dynamic stuff right now. One thing I like to to try to show is that when we when we had the original model without the sharks, um, we don't even necessarily have to have. We go to the original one even without the cycling. And I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about this this bit that I showed that the two cases um, where where I changed the amount that the um, that, that the fish are feeding on the, um, on the phytoplankton. I reduced that and that actually changed the, 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 uh, the, the um, that changed the utility matrix, uh, the signs of the utility matrix. So if we could run the original one that we did that you had set up originally, and then if we could change that so that we had a smaller, smaller flow from the fish to phytoplankton to fish, then to compare those so that we could actually see the the, the same kind of result. I just want to right. want to make an analogy to the to the to the model that we did. Sure. So right now the relationship between the fish is that the fish affects the phytoplankton negatively. Okay. Whereas the phytoplankton affects the fish positively. Right. So it corresponds to the to case one that I had in the right. So so here uh, basically fish is feeding on the phytoplankton, so it's affected negatively. But if this flow occurs a lot less than these two. Mm -hmm. and that would be the opposite scenario. So let's check that. So let's have the rate from phytoplankton to fish, let's say 10 times smaller. Okay. So right now the fish affects the phytoplankton positively. And the reason for that is uh, this is not as strong as the as these two now, and the more the fish, the less the zooplankton, the more the phyto. Right. And hence, so uh, yeah. Yeah. So so basically, the it, it, the idea is is that if you is it is it is it what the utility analysis in this case is able to show you is that is that for this given model structure, okay, where you've got a where you've got a, a predator here that's feeding on. The intermediate predator, the prey, the zooplankton, and also, excuse me, the uh, the fish. Sorry, the fish is feeding on the zooplankton. I'm I'm looking at it the opposite way. Fish is feeding on the zooplankton and the phytoplankton. The zooplankton only feeding on the fish, but the zooplankton has the fish also as a predator. That structure, the how the relationship between these compartments, utility analysis has. We, we've done some models on this, uh, different models, and it's shown that this in this particular case. That, that the weight of the flows is going to actually determine that. In certain really simple cases, okay, for example, if you have one, two predators and one prey, okay, just, just if you had phytoplankton, if you had zooplankton and, and fish 
feeding on the phytoplankton, but not on each other. It would just be a competitive relationship, no matter what the flows are. So what this what this tells you is is that when when you're doing this this analysis is is that is that is that it, it, you've got an interplay between how you're structuring the model. For example, when you introduce the cycling, we change the structure, introduce the whole new flow. In this particular case, all we did was change we changed the the uh, we changed essentially the, the final weight of the flow. The engineer did it in the simulation by changing the, the coefficient, but the resulting the result of that was was that the was that the was that the steady state values at the end of the simulation that it came to actually changed. And so you one thing I think that's really useful about Econet and that will and that, and that interplays with the environment analysis is, is that is that when you when you can change your model. And then you do a simulation and you say, okay, I understand the, the, um, the situation in terms of the, how, the, how the values change over time. But then when you look inside the model in terms of things like the indirect effects or cycling index or the utility analysis, you can actually sort of, sort of peek under the hood of the model, so to speak, using the systems analysis to actually tell you, so what does it really mean when I change that? And so that, to me, that's a powerful feature of Econet because of the fact that you can, it, it has such a nice flexible uh, situation where you can, you can change, the, change the, the, the different parameters and even change the structure of the model fairly easily. But then you can compare that. So the idea is, is if you use this in your work and you have a, set, a model and you say, well, I'd really like to know, you know, is it, does it really matter, you know, if I have this interaction, you know, be zero or non-zero or does it really matter if this interaction or this one or various ones in the model are really are strong or weak. Now, if you get a really complicated model, you know, this can of course get more difficult. We're, we're dealing with fairly small models. And so, it, you know, the interpretation is often a lot more straightforward, but the, but the same principles apply. So I don't know if you have any more to add to that, Janir, go, please do. So, so, so uh, I think we'll be open to questions now. So do you want people to say questions, Janir? Do you want them to chat them and then we call on folks? Or how, how, we, how do we really want to do that? Do you I, I believe we matter? did so like have people raise hands and then uh, in, in Zoom. So let me stop share. So I think uh, in the participants list, there is the option to raise a hand. And if you do so, uh, we will basically call your name and uh, or, or you can use chat, whichever, whichever people feel more comfortable, I guess. So you can either raise your hand and ask your question verbally or, or you know, comments, or you can just write it on the chat and we can entertain. Right. And it can be on any part of it. It can be on, 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 it can be on what we talked about, what I talked about in the presentation or on the things we talked about in Econet. E either, one is, either one is fair game as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, if you'd like to speak up, I'll note that everybody is pretty much muted. So. You can, yeah, you, you're allowed to unmute yourself, folks, by the way, if you want to ask a question for, uh, in, you know, aud aud with auditory. Kim asked, uh, do I don't have the hand raise function. Uh, hmm. So I hope that is not the same for everybody. But uh, well, if, we're you're a, if you're a host, you don't have the raise hand. If it's a participant, they can raise hands. Okay. okay. And that's on the bottom of the participant list. The bottom of the part, yeah. Yeah, if you open your participant window, if you And click everyone on, can unmute themselves if needed. Right. Thank you. Um, so, so Kim's question is, what are the units of the pool in the model? Okay, are you talking about the models that, that Janir is running? Or are you talking about the, the models that, 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 I was, that I was doing in the in the um, in the presentation. Hi, this is Kim. I think I'll just unmute me. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about uh, Econet. So uh, the pools of the uh, so the sharks, the phytoplankton. So what what values would you use, perhaps from the fields, to populate those values, or what units are they? Right. So 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 the units are entirely user defined, and that is because of the rates. So let's say the if if, if let's say the uh, unit is kilogram nitrogen. Now 
the rate of flow, if the unit is kilogram nitrogen, would be a thousand times less if the unit were one gram of nitrogen. So basically the units are inherently or, or implicitly included or defined by the flow rates, the C or the R values. Uh, that, that also is defining the time unit, day versus week versus month, let's say. Does that make sense? I think so. So if you were to go in the fields, uh, it would at least be a, a mass. So for your, uh, I would say your zooplankton and your fish, you couldn't use something like abundance, I imagine, right? So you do have to uh think about mass and then use the same units and that would be that would be the way to do it yes it, it, it would not uh, the, the the entire network analysis uh literature uh, or the analysis method methodology is based on conservation so the units have to be the flow currency has to be a conserved quantity what that means is then let's say if you have um, uh, an insect eater that is going to consume uh, 100, an anteater, you know, consuming 100 ants, but gaining a little bit biomass at the end. So 100 individuals will be lost, but like 0.1 anteater will be gained. So that would be the loss of conservation. That's why it has to be in terms of biomass. So if it's comparing phytoplankton and fish, you would compare the total biomass of the phytoplankton with the total biomass of the fish. Right, so and then you can just decide your own time unit. So perhaps an average of a year or an average of a day or, right. okay. Exactly. So I'll make a general comment to you, Kim. Basically what only thing that's required and it works, it's, it'll work this way in Econet or in using the other analysis uh, packages. I, I didn't really talk a lot about units in, the, in, the, in, in, my, in my talk, I, maybe I should have. But basically the, the whole idea is, is that all the compartments the only requirement is, is that all the compartments have the same units. So you can't, you can't have different units for different compartments. If you use grams of carbon or you use grams of dry biomass, you use kilocalories uh, to represent energy or you use grams of water or milliliters of water, it doesn't really matter what your units are. They have to be the same. They're consistent. So all the flows that you see in the things I presented as well as what you see in Econet those, those, those flows represent the same units. And the biomass, the, 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 the biomass of the X, the compartments, X1, X2, or the fish, whichever they are, those all represent the same units. They represent different categories of the units, okay? But they represent the same unit. That's really the, that's really the only requirement, essentially, right. for consistency. Great, okay. thanks. And Brian Pat asks, uh, does the new version of Econet include calculations for the information theory indices that Professor Ulanovic covered this morning? Um, unfortunately, I was not at that uh, talk. Uh, so I will ask Brian to comment on what those are. Is it the ratio of the, uh, ratio of the, overhead to the uh, yeah, it's, it's the, or, yeah it's the average mutual information over the um, total system capacity so it's it, basically those three terms overhead AMI and total system capacity. right uh, yes yes it, it, it will um, okay, good. it's, it's um, the, the currently the only ones that we have I believe are the ascendancy and the overhead let's check um, uh, it has ascendancy and development capacity. Uh, now, we just, well, uh, it has been understood, I guess, that, that those by themselves are highly correlated with blue flow. So it makes a lot more sense to take a look at their ratios. So those ratios, as well as the, the, the measures themselves will be included. And I believe that when you go to the ratios, AMI over, so I think both of them are, I think these do, like ascendancy, I believe is just the true flow scale version of average mutual okay. information. So uh, I think the ratios turn out to be the same. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. it. Thank you, yes. Okay, uh, thanks. Sure. Um, I just saw somebody ask something about, about the, um, 
about Econet as a package in R. And I guess, I mean, I, I let Janir talk a little bit about Econet after, but what I would respond to that would be that yeah, Econet and R do, there's a lot of overlap between the three packages that, that were mentioned. The, the, the earliest one that's actually Brian Fath, who just asked the question, uh, was the primary developer of is a MATLAB uh, set of things to do the, the, the network analysis uh, work, do the through flow and storage. And I'm not sure whether or not it, it does utility on it. It very well may, I'm not sure, but, but and the R package does, um, does pretty much everything that Econet does, except it's not a simulator. It, it works on simply the, the steady state uh, values and it has a lot of other um, measures that, that, that Stuart Bourne and Matt Lau have put into it. And so I think if you have a set of a model or set of models you're developing, you could actually freely use e any of these. Um, Econet was designed to be able to use on the web and Janir can, can make a comment as to whether or not that has, you know, he can, it can be used offline or whatever. I'm not sure um, the advantage of that would be. Or how that as much be. as anything, it's uh, certainly, so the question is, is there a chance of the Econet as a package in R? to work offline. Um, it, it's certainly possible. It would be very difficult on my part in that interpreter, the part that takes in the model and uh, extracts it as a differential equation uh, is, is a, a, a shell script which is uh, very different than a, a, an, an R. Uh, a second complication which would be a little less probably would be the speed. Uh, right now, Econet uses uh, C, C++, uh, as its numerical engine, and it's going to be uh, significantly slower. Not significantly, but uh, it wouldn't scale as well when run with uh, R. It would still work, um, but large models would, like in Econet, you can actually put, I think, as much as you can put 200 compartment models and it'll run. It, it actually is really fast on that front. Uh, well, one thing that you, that but, you uh, could do. Theoretically, it is doable. Will it occur in the next two, three years? I don't think so. But if uh, there's a demand, we can basically accommodate it and have, you know, hire somebody to one work. Uh, I, I would say that one way you can interact them would be that if you wanted to do some, some experimentation with doing some of the simulations in Econet, and right. you wanted to take advantage of some of the, there are some additional analyses that are included in ENAR. I wasn't able to go over them because right. we just don't have enough time here. But if you look at the reference and also if you go to the, um, to the online, um, the online um, uh, work, um, demonstration that Stuart Board and Matt have put together and some other folks, um, you'll get a sense of what's available. But once you have the steady state model, Really, I mean, ENAR and the MATLAB function are going to do the network analysis, and they have some of them have certain things that they're not all exactly the same. I, I think what Monica refers to is like you, you don't have to be on for to use Ethernet, you have to be online, right? And that's the limitation. And uh, I, I, I try to include so well, the way that I try to extend this is you know. Being online is basically being common, but it's still an issue if you're in the field. Um, but uh, the way the way that I like to so Econet is free. I like I want Econet to be as easily used and best integrated with other software as possible. So um, I try to include you know it ex, it will output in MATLAB format. It will output the spreadsheet. It will output in ENAR R format so that it can be integrated in a lot of things. It might also be possible to have to call Econet in R through an API, an interface. Uh, that, that, that might be a possibility. Uh, but, but that would also require internet connection yet again. Yeah. If you have any suggestions or, you know, uh, please, please do. That's how Econet is going to be shaped in the future, anyways. Thank you very much for the answer. I was just I was just curious because I'm using R and I've been doing a path analysis and the other SEM modeling. So that was just a thought, but thanks for concern. It's just, it's not like I would be pushing or something, just an idea. Maybe 
maybe there will be more people so in the future if we have time you know just yeah to, no, no uh, if you ask because yeah. that's how we're, that's how we can kind of know that what people need so that we can you know that's for everybody to use that's why it's free but we would like it to be as useful as possible so you know uh, whether it's possible or not but you know right. if, if there's a demand we will try to make it happen well Thank the easiest for. way is right now having this online in, in the web so I don't have to you know write any codes and scripting and be bothered just put the model put the information and it and it does the whole work and I just wait for results that that's a perfect but you know sometimes you want to take your data and it, that was just just a thought. Thank yeah, you for, for the concern. I appreciate great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we've got about 20 minutes left. Um, should we see get some feedback from folks as to what 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 they might want us to, to do in terms of whether we want to do more uh, more gaming experiment things with Econet or if they want to talk about you know other 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 issues of, of network analysis or other things that that we've got. I mean, I, I mean, we we we've sort of presented the basic idea. I mean, there's a whole lot more, obviously, of different different kinds of things that could be done. It's a lot to it's a lot to absorb in terms of you know in terms of trying to understand the the background of of, of NEA and the interpretation. But so either that or do you have any ideas, Janir, for some for 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 something else that you want to try or or do you want to do you want to see if we get any feedback? Either you can either say it through chat, or you can just or you can just unmute yourself and 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 make a you know make a comment to us about something you want to see, or or if you have a question about about something we talked about that you want us to try to clarify. Anything to add, Janir? Uh, no. There is one more question: Are there capabilities of including effects of environmental factors to the groups? in the model. Hmm. Um, can I ask to clarify, uh, like, perhaps by an example from Kim? Sure. Um, so maybe uh, effects of um, temperature or, or salinity or, or anything like right. that. Yes, yes, there are. Uh, that's basically uh, the flow rates will be dependent on time or certain parameters, right? Is that what you mean? Uh, well, I'm just wondering if is this just predator prey or are there other factors that can affect uh, the size of the pools of these groups over time? Um, the size of the pools are purely managed by the flow of inputs and outputs to each compartment. However, like, uh, so let's say the phytoplankton bloom through irradiance levels, right? So they're basically the uh, capability of nitrogen uptake of the phytoplankton will be dependent on the irradiance levels. So, so if there's a lot of light, it'll, so it will basically be a function of time in, 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 in uh, a way, like as, as, it's, uh, as the daylight uh, duration increases, it will be able to feed more. So, so, and that will be a function of time. And, what, and that means that the input into phytoplankton would change by time. Okay. Um, so maybe so, uh, that's an interesting example of how to change irradiance on phytoplankton or, or something uh, like that. Before, well, before we go too much further, I mean, it's a great example, Janir. But what I would point out is that is that the, is that is that what <laughs> what you're asking is a, is kind of a it's it's a modeling it's a modeling question, obviously, and it's it's relevant to what we're doing. But the beauty of Econet is that is that basically all of the all of the things that are going to affect the flow, whether it's an input from outside the system, or an output from a compartment, or the, or the interactions between the or the, the flows between the between the compartments, all of that is essentially put into those into those into those into those one into that one coefficient. So, I think what you would what you would have to do if you wanted to use this, if you had a conceptual model that had a whole had, had one or more types of controls of things that whether it's temperature, whether it's irradiance, whether it's moisture, whether it's all sorts of things, you would have to build it, you have to have a conceptual model, and then you would have to decide how those things end up changing 
that that parameter, whatever, whichever it is, the, the the lumped parameter, as I would call it, in Econet, and then you would have to then you would have to go ahead and run the model again. Thing is, is that Econet isn't really designed to create these these. I mean, you, I suppose it, there are, there are ways you could do it if you could design a way to have a function so that C was not right. just not just a constant. But but it but it would take it would take some it would take some creative doing. Generic and um, what I said. Yeah, so so uh, okay. we we thought about this like instead of having a C equals R equals V equals, we could have like an F equals where somebody can input a function that includes Correct. time as well as other compartments. Sometimes a compartment would affect a flow between two other compartments differently. Right. Like a predator its appearance is going to decrease the feeding rate. So those could be theoretically done. And we thought about how to do that. The, the one issue that I come up with, besides it being not so easy, is the flexibility would probably be, a, would have to be compromised. In, in other words, right now, it's Econet is so easy, you just do C equals R equals V equals, and it just runs. But if you want like free function entry, uh, the input would probably be not as simple as before. Right. It's doable though, and it's it, it. So the thing is, if you have such a system, Econet becomes useless because it doesn't accommodate that. Mm -hmm. So I think for those type of systems, one way to go ahead in my mind, which is not realized yet though, is to have a different interface with more structure, right. where the flows are written line by line and the right. function is written next to it. Right. But that one, wouldn't be hard to turn into a differential equation and simulate. Right. Well, if you if you're interested. Yeah. I'll comment if you're interested in doing the network analysis part, okay, then 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 really you need you whatever simulator you use, whether you whether you have your own whether you have your own program you write in whatever language R, Python, or even some other language, C or something, or you or you do it in Stella, once you get that, then you can do the network analysis. The beauty of of, of, of Econet really, and, and I guess the, it's the beauty and the weakness. As Janir said, it was designed to be this way. Is that, is that you can gen up a model, okay, and then and modify it fairly easily. It's it's fairly it's fairly transparent that way, and then you can get a simulation of it using the various methods that that Janir talked about, and then you can do the network analysis. But if if you're talking about getting really into doing a lot of this bit where you've got these complex functions, then I think. You're either going to have to go one of two routes. Either you're going to have to use a program like Stella, and there are others, I'm sure, I'm, that's the one I'm most familiar with, where you can do, you know, you can actually set up, you know, function, control functions for these various inputs, outputs, or intercompartmental flows. Or, or if you write your own, of course, then it, you can write it any kind of arbitrary function, as Janir pointed out. So I guess, I guess it, you know, it, there's ways you could do it, it, and I think you, there are ways that that, that that it could address it, but once you get, I think, too far away from 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 this from the simple sort of simple setup, not that it's simple in terms of the background, but in terms of the way it, it the way you build the model, it, it, that part gets very tricky. I think, but right at that point, but Janir can make an additional comment if he if he has one. Great, got it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? And I'll throw out a general thing is that right now we've got, I guess, about 15, a little less than 15 minutes. If any of the, if anybody that's here that's seen what we've done, and I know, like I said, it's, it's very hard to absorb all this because you're absorbing, you know, a, a, a theoretical uh, background and, and, a, and a set of analyses that are, that are not that, not always that easy to understand if you've never sat and dealt with them before and an analysis program that is also a simulator by the way and has a lot of um, things that you have to learn about it it's a lot to absorb but if anybody has anything that they want us to either talk about more expand more on or use the time to go into econet and you know and try something and see if it happens that could be something that might be useful or if somebody has some other idea you know about how they think would be useful to use the time i mean basically we're here to try to help you to understand you know what we've done you know so that so that at the end of this you will at least be able to go away and say well at least i have some idea of what you know of how i might how i might actually do this 
you know, with, with some sort of, with something, with some, uh, some scenario, either some, some setup that you have that from your, you know, from your own work that you either have an existing model or a model that you have an idea you want to build. Does that sound reasonable, Janir? You could ex sure. expand. Or if you had run Econet yourself, meanwhile, and got an error or any questions about what you did, you feel free to share your screen and comment on it. And I don't think they can actually do that, Janir. I, I, I think that. I and I guess we could allow them to, right? Yeah, they, they can send us comments and they can they can talk to us, but I'm not so sure they can share our screen. But they can they could they could uh, send a, a model by chat and we you could run okay. it yeah. or something like that if they want to. I mean, I'm not. Or they or they could just send you send something to you and say, can you try this? And then you could just implement an Econet. That's one way to do it. I mean, depending on what people want. I mean, I. I we don't have any strict uh, rules here about what to what to try or do. Really, I mean, it's really it, at this point. I think a lot of it is up to what you guys are thinking. I know it's a lot to absorb. So, at this point, you might have some questions about, you know, about about what what some of the things we're doing mean, or or how 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 what we're doing interfaces with with your the things that you're interested in, either your set of models or or the kinds of things that that you do in in your uh, you know in your in your work. I mean, I'm monitoring Econet right now, so if anybody has run something or has issues, I can comment on the model directly without even uh, sending anything. Well, if there are no questions, comments, we can perhaps end the meeting, or what do we do? I, it's, up to, it's up to these guys. I'm just, I just don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to shortchange folks, but if folks are, if folks are, if everybody's okay with, you know, with what we've done, I, I just, you know, I, we have only heard from a few handful of folks, but so I hesitate to end, but I, I, I'd like to see if, if anybody has any, you know, anything they want us to try to clarify. We don't have a ton of time, so we don't have a lot of time to go into a lot of, you know, into a lot more, you know, detail on, on some of the things. A lot of the things were sort of brushed over very quickly because you know we, we, we had we were trying to cover a lot of a lot of ground here obviously and it, it's it is a lot to absorb so it could be that people are maybe yeah. a little bit overwhelmed by the you know by all of the different pieces and don't have anything specific to uh, so shall we ask our host to see what should we do oh uh, yeah. one last question uh, yeah, is there a way came up I think it's Kim again. Is there a way to remove mass from a group? Export migration, phishing, branch removal. Uh, that, that would be done by, again, um, adding a flow to the environment. So uh, if you'd like to remove a mass uh, over time though, I guess, right? Is it over time? Yes. Right, so, so, so you can certainly have, so if there is, uh, if, if the deer migrate over time, you could basically have deer and arrow and then star and the migration rate. Why don't you share your screen, Janair, and then we can, maybe you could sh tell, tell us how to do an example, Kim, maybe. See if you could try that. That might, that might help for her to sure. understand, or me to understand what she means and her to understand what-, what So, 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 so uh, right, so I, actually this term right here would be seen as death or migration. And uh, we, we can increase that, so let, let's run that for now. And we would see an output. Uh, oh, it's still doing this. Yeah, stochastic. you're doing the you're doing the stochastic. It's a little hard to to deal with okay. that. Let's do the regular one. So right, so the fish, so it, it, it stabilizes around like two units, uh, and if we uh, change this to let's say two, it would it would basically a, it would be a migration basically or death and. That's leaving the boundary. So it does not matter if, you know, leaves the boundary to afterlife or so, another so, space of uh, water. Okay, I have a question related to what you say. When you say removing from a group, do you mean from a set of compartments, more than one, or do you just mean from any particular compartment that happens to be in the model? That's what I'm trying to... Right, I mean any particular compartment. Okay. So for example, from the fish group, you could have a fishery. Maybe you could represent that with a model by some type of removal term. I see. So do you mean, can you have multiple outputs? Janir would have to answer that. I don't think that you can oh, specifically. Um, no, doesn't care. So if the output is 
uh, it does not, if the output is like out, uh, but it's not really, we do not really care where, uh, it, it is all lumped into one sum. So this okay. sum here. So for example, to represent a fishery here, if you wanted to know that as a real, if you want to have another output, you could actually create fishery or humans here and then have a flow to it and then just leave the output from fish being just general mortality yeah. or, 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 or immigration from the, from the, from the bit. So otherwise, if, if you want to, you can't have multiple outputs in terms of to the environment, but if you, but if you, if you wanted to know about something that had another output and then you wanted just a general output of the environment, that's certainly feasible. Okay. Does that make sense, Kim, what I just said? Yeah, yeah, and that's indeed more what I mean, because it's not okay. just an output to the uh, okay. system, it's actually taking away from the system somehow. Right. So, so I just put in like, you know, fish catch, and, mm -hmm. and, and again, we really do not, are not, you're not including details of humans in our model, so I just put right. zero for the initial condition. And you'll see right. this is basically, the catch is accumulating over time, and right. that's, Correct, because it would be accumulating over time, right? Right. Right. So it gets to, the, those kinds of issues become difficult modeling issues here because, for example, you know, the people are obviously not the fish aren't just accumulating, you know, on the dock or on the boat. They're getting they're getting brought and you know and sold and sent to markets. And so, so in order to really do that realistically, you know, you, if you had it as a compartment, you would kind of have to have, you know, an output as well. But you could you could play with that in terms of the fact that, you know, no matter how you no matter how you set this up, the Econet is going to try to do it. And it, for example, here when you don't include an output from the from the humans, that tells you, okay, wait a minute, maybe my conceptual model is a little, you know, maybe that's not really exactly what's happening because, of course, you know, you're not just taking fish out of the system and just they're not just piling up and accumulating forever. You know, they're they're going to go somewhere. So that gives you an idea of how that the, the that gives you an idea of how with Econet you get this fast feedback mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. in terms of once you you create it, you know you run it, then boom, you know you're you're gonna you're gonna see the result, and then you then you can scratch your head and say, well, is that really what I meant? Or if this is was what you meant, then you know what are the implications of that for what I you know for how I'm trying to conceptualize my system? So if if that makes sense. So if you have any other comments, Junior, go ahead. Nope. Great, thank you. So does that make sense, Kim? Yeah, it does. So yeah. I did indeed want to, so it doesn't return to detritus or the, or the environment. So that you do indeed have the ability to remove something. So uh, yeah. yeah, I can see that. Right. We have about like two, three minutes. Any last minute questions? Yeah, last minute. We basically at this point we're at last minute questions of anything you want to ask us before. Of course, you know, you can email us and those kinds of things because you know I assume everybody got people's emails. I'm not sure about that, but I'm assuming that you did. Right. right. So if you if you keep feedback here, and if you just write something, uh, that will send me an email, or you can directly send me an email. Again, it's uh, my first name at uga.edu. Right. Um, and I think my, I think people, the people, I think people got my email through the, through the, through the, uh, through the registration site. I'm not positive of that, but if you don't, you know, I can, I could, I could send a number of email to all the participants, except the one person that was uh, Faye, V, however he said exactly how it says his name um, and send it. I did, I did not, yeah, well, you have my email because I sent it. That's correct. So you can, you could respond to that. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. Sorry, my brain is a little off right now. I, I've been scrambling here trying to process everything. But so did we get any did we get any other questions? Or does anybody have any last minute things before we sign up? We had last uh, thanks for the presentation. Do you have any lesson uh, plans related to Econet? If not, and if I develop one. Would you want me to send it to you? Absolutely. Uh, and if you'd like to discuss this, if there's any way that I could help, please uh, get in touch with me. Uh, I, yeah. I'd be happy to share the presentation that I have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did, I've been given these over, over time at the various conferences. I, I'd be happy to uh, work with you or help you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would too, to the extent, I'm not an expert on Econet, but as far as you know developing models and doing analysis and things like that i'm i've, I've done a lot of that if, if you were interested in 
you know, in any input from, from me as well. I'm not an e the expert on Econet is, is right here, Janir, because he's the one who. And I'd be happy to, you know, receive anything that you've developed as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Cassandra. Thank you. I guess we'll defer to our host. Uh, okay, I guess if we don't hear anything else, I guess yeah, people are people are signing or are, are, are signing off. So I think folks must be done, from what I can tell, unless somebody had any last minute things. So okay. thank you guys for participating. Thanks for the for the questions and, and comments and things. We appreciate it. I hope you got something out of it, those of you that are still there listening and um thank you all right